prelude is over. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Just a few announcements. It's, today is a full Sunday. It is Christ the King Sunday. And in good fashion, not only are we focusing our lives and centering ourselves on Christ who is King, but we are also welcoming new members. We're actually welcoming the whole morning new members. Uh, if you notice the, the insert, there's 20 new members that are part of the congregation who are wanting to be um, official and active in the church, and, and what a blessing that is. In the information folder, there are a lot of announcements, and I can't go through all of them. But please note there is a wonderful Thanksgiving service that will happen this Wednesday. They are looking for our volunteers to help decorate the Christmas tree on Friday. And next Sunday begins a series of Advent where we're going to be celebrating Advent through some cross-generational activities in the gym between the services. If you wonder, what is a cross-gen activity? Well, a cross-gen activity is multiple generations joining together at the foot of the cross to learn and grow in the love of Jesus. And, and that's the simple explanation for it. A lot of fun ways to uh, take things home for your family to enjoy over the Advent season. Uh, of course, when we say family, we're not just talking about people with children, we're talking about every family unit that's part of the church. So please make a point to stop in the gym next week, even if you're a little apprehensive and you want to kind of just look at things that are happening, stop in there and check it out because I think it's going to be something quite enjoyable. I believe that is all for the announcements this morning. Oh, uh, Stewardship Sunday, Noble's looking at me with panicked eyes that I'm going to forget. Uh, stewardship Sunday is also today, and, and our stewardship campaign this fall has been rather relaxed uh, because the fact of the matter is we've had an incredibly generous year. God's Spirit has worked among us, and, and we've had all of our needs met in a way that is, is pretty profound and, and actually quite beautiful when you think about our call to be a congregation. So this week and over the next couple of weeks, if you bring those pledge cards, which are always really helpful in how we put together our yearly budget, if you bring those pledge cards, there is a basket in the narthex. You can stick those in the basket, and then we use that to formulate our budget throughout the year. A huge thank you to Noble and his team for putting together the stewardship campaign this fall, and, and really that message of of give with a grateful heart. Um, we are responding to all that God has done for us, and God has certainly been a, at work in profound ways. I think that's all for the announcements. As we come into worship on this Christ the King Sunday, let us stand together as we confess our sins and receive God's forgiveness. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you. And for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, it gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. Join with me in singing our opening hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns.
our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. set us free to be people of God, power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and blessing and glory are his. This is the feast a victory for our God. Alleluia. Sing with all the people of God and join in the hymn of all creation. Honor 
be with you. Let us pray together the prayer of the day as printed in our bulletin. Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things to your beloved Son, whom you anointed priest forever and King of all creation, grant that all the people of the earth, now divided by the power of sin, may be united under the glorious and gentle rule of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, I invite our new members forward. If you could stand here, please. Dave and Lynn and Mary, we welcome you as members of our Savior's Lutheran. Oh, sorry, I didn't want to exclude. <laughs> oh, please. It's going to be one of those days today. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Good morning. We welcome you as new members of our Savior's Lutheran to join with us in worshiping God, hearing his word, sharing his supper, proclaiming the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, serving all people and striving for justice and peace in all the earth. If you would take a moment and introduce yourself to the congregation, you may remove your mask so you're nice and clear, and, and you can say whatever you like about yourself briefly as we kind of just move along. I know, sorry, you're first. You stood next to me. <laughs> Most people avoid me. My name is Andy Steigelman, and, and uh, we just joined this church in what, August, I think. Um, primarily, initially, for our granddaughter, who's attending school here, but we also wanted a place to be able to come weekly and have the support of the people of the parish. Uh, my name is Jeff Steigelman, I'm her husband, and uh, pretty much everything she said. <laughs> Thank you for having us. We feel very welcomed here. My name is David Beatty. This is my wife, Linda. We live in Woodburn, where we've lived for almost 20 years after retiring from the Air Force. And Linda grew up in Wisconsin. Yeah. We need more Wisconsin. <laughs> right here. Yeah. Linda Beatty, and I'm pleased to know that someone else is from Wisconsin, too. <laughs> Happy to be here. Thank you, Linda. My name is Mary Davidson, and I, I grew up in Wisconsin, the land of the Lutherans. <laughs> and my kids go to church here, Orion and Catherine, and I'm so grateful to be able to worship with them and everyone else. Thank you. I'm Marge Walling. My husband, Jerry, is sitting up there. <laughs> and uh, we're just very grateful to be here and enjoying the congregation. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus reminds us in the Gospel of John, the 13th chapter, a new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, you also must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Paul writes in the book of Romans, the 15th chapter, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify God the Father, the God, God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for these new members. By your life-giving power, bind us to each other and in you. Strengthen us for service. Support us all our days as we work to serve you in all that we do. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We welcome you into the congregation. How about another round of applause?
Thank you. You may be seated. And the, the choral group has a wonderful anthem for us today. And fee, feel free to join us uh, as you're able, as, as the words come up on the screen. <clears throat> A beautiful refrain. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you for reminding the congregation that they actually can sing with the choir, if ever asked. Our first reading today comes from the book of Daniel, the seventh chapter. As I watched, thrones were set in place, and an ancient one took his throne. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair on his head pure wool. His throne was fiery fiery flames and its wheels burning fire. 
A stream of fire issued and flowed out from his presence. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood attending him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. As I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient one and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kinship, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kinship is one that shall never be destroyed. A reading from the book of Revelation, the first chapter. To John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and him who was and who, him who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look. He is coming with clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is yet to come, the Almighty. Please stand. The Holy Gospel today comes from St. John, the 18th chapter. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation, the chief priests, have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Grace to and peace this day from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. From Advent to Christmas to Epiphany, then Lent, Easter, Pentecost, Ordinary Time, Reformation, All Saints, and today. Today is the end of our church year. It is Christ the King Sunday. Our church year begins and ends establishing the authority of Jesus Christ for us as we live a life of faith. But here's something unique about Christ the King that you may not know. Christ the King Sunday actually was often observed on what became Reformation Sunday. In the 1800s, the Catholic Pope at the time reminded the church not to forget Christ as King, which designated a movement from Re Reformation Sunday. But it wasn't until 1925 when Christ the King Sunday actually moved. Pope Pius XI wrote this, Manifold evils in the world were due to the fact that the majority of men had thrust Jesus Christ and his holy law out of their lives. That those who had no place either in private affairs or in politics. And we said further that as long as individuals and states refused to submit to the rule of our Savior, 
there would be no real hopeful prospect of lasting peace among the nations. How do you like that for a decree? Thrust Jesus Christ and his holy law out of their lives. He was speaking to the wars of the world, the unrest that was found in every corner of every nation, the desperation for God that was being felt around the globe. Seems relevant for today, doesn't it? So here we are. Here we are, we sit on this Christ the King Sunday, and the nature of this celebration is to centralize ourself on the God of truth. The God of truth who was born as we are born, who came into the world to speak truth in the face of the master of lies. In a world that tries to convince us that we can declare our own truth, that we can name our own independence, that we can emancipate ourselves for our own authority, God speaks. And God calls us back to a truth that can be found only in him. Today in our readings from Daniel to Revelation, we hold this balance of what has been and what will be and what is yet to come. Often these two texts are interpreted as ap uh, apocalyptic literature. I need to slow down today. I've had too much coffee. We re read these as apocalyptic literature, but these texts reflect more of what God has done and is doing in the world than what God will do. It names Jesus Christ as the one who has come and who still reigns as we wait for him to come again. Today, as we sing about Christ, as we celebrate Christ the King, it is all about submitting to his authority. Now, there are many ways that we can note Jesus Christ as our king. He certainly is a king beyond any worldly authority. The ways he pre presents himself as king is outside of what the world would present as authority. And there's a thousand ways to look at Christ the king today. But as we dive in this text, I want to take a little different of a path. Because today, as we centralize our ideas and our focus on Jesus, I want to talk about Pilate. Len Sweet, my mentor, likes to say, everyone knows a pilot, everyone is a pilot. Now, the first time I heard him say that, I have to confess, I didn't really appreciate what he was saying. Everyone knows a Pontius Pilate, everyone is a Pontius Pilate. I don't want to be a pilot, do you? I don't want to be one who rejects and one who confuses. Pilate, in the historical account, is a terrible leader. He's known for cruelty, but cruelty in a way that mocked people in their beliefs. Pilate was never successful in commanding authority. He was more like a bully than he was a governing authority. Are we really okay with being called Pilate? Are we really okay with a world full of Pilates? This is where I hold fear. Because as I look at the world around us, I can't but help but wonder, maybe that's exactly what we have. And so as we look to our gospel, Jesus is summoned to stand before this bully. Pilate looks at the Nazarite and says, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus stands before a Roman authority. The religious authorities of the time have done all that they have power to do. He has been beaten and he has been mocked. He has suffered. But see, the Jews did not have the authority to put a man to death. They could only humiliate him. They could only break his body. They could not end his life. In fact, to end his life was against the law of Yahweh. Thou shall not kill. And so the temple authorities had to bring in the Roman authorities to actually have the right to crucify. 
Because the one crime that was punishable by death in the Roman Empire was to speak against the Roman Empire. That'll get you crucified. To challenge the Roman Empire, that was what was going to hang you on a cross. No authority could be greater than that of Rome. And to make any claim against the Roman Empire, well, here we are. Now, in all of the ways that this interaction could have happened, there are two results that come from Jesus standing before Pilate. And that's where I want to focus today. The first result that comes from Jesus standing before Pilate is that of truth. The importance of truth is emphasized and established forever in this moment. Pilate and Jesus stand facing each other. A question is asked, are you the king of the Jews? And you'll notice if you read this text, neither one actually defines the answer. Pilate makes an assumption in verse 37, but it's a rather poor translation that we read. We read, so you say. But when you look at the Greek, what is actually more accurate is the response is, well, that's how you see it. But let me say it another way. Well, think about that. Jesus before Pilate, that's how you see it. But let me open your eyes. Now, you have to appreciate Jesus' ministry to really get to the depth of this interaction. Because Jesus, in his ministry, he is asked 307 questions. He asks those around him 183 questions. He only answers three. It's like having a conversation with a teenager. Right? He's asked 307 questions. He asks others 183. He only gives three answers. Jesus isn't about giving answers, but rather leading those who are seeking answers to the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus says. Pilate, he wants to know what is truth. As a governing authority trying to navigate all of the political systems of the times, he wants to know what is true. And as he stands with Jesus before him, he is looking truth in the face, but he doesn't know what to do with it. Is that what we are? Are we seeking truth in our lives? Are we looking at the world and wondering what is truth in this world? And yet we have the word of God right before us and we still can't quite conceptualize what truth is all about. Is there a familiarity there? Aren't we a little too much like Pilate from time to time? When we have God's word before us and yet our question is, what is truth? Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? It seems like everyone in the world wants to define who Jesus is, and yet the answer of who Jesus is is about to be known to all. See, we live in a world that is all about declaring what we believe, what is our truth. We live in a world where opinions become facts. We size up one another, don't we? When we stand before each other, we're trying to figure out whose truth is right. When we think that we are what matters, Jesus stands before us and changes what our claims are meant to be. See, this is why truth matters. It matters to Pilate in this moment, and it should matter to each of us. Pilate is emphasizing truth above any political ideologies and affiliations. Pilate's putting Jesus on the spot, and he's saying, Are you? Are you the king of the Jews? In response to Jesus' non-answer, Pilate will have Jesus flogged and beaten. And when it's not enough to satisfy the religious authorities of the time, Pilate will let the people speak their opinion. Give us Barabbas, they will shout. Because they won't know what truth is either. What is truth? As Pilate and Jesus have this interaction, there is a moment when we realize that Pilate 
may know more than we think he does. Because the second thing that occurs with Pilate in this moment is that once he hands Pilate or Jesus over to be crucified, he gives the first witness to who Jesus is. Does he not? The sign that hangs above Jesus on the cross. It is the first witness to who Jesus is. It says he is the king of the Jews. Now this sign is interesting. All four of the Gospels note it, right? It's written in Hebrew for the Jews. It's written in Greek for the educated, for the Romans. It's written in Latin for the elite. And it's written in Aramaic for the countryside. Look to Daniel once again. The book of Daniel that professes that all the ends of the earth will know that he is king. Pilate does so in this moment by declaring he is king. And when the Roman author when the temple authorities push Pilate and they say, no, 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 he's not our king. He said he was king. Pilate will not relent. The guy who likes to bully, who is often bullied, will not stand down. Even though he doesn't completely understand what he's doing, even though he doesn't fully grasp who this Jesus is or what God is all about, as he is not a Jew, he professes the kinship of God in this world. Where do we find ourselves in this story? Are we like Pilate? Are we trying to navigate the political voices of this world and finding God in it? Or are we standing with the truth of God facing the world around us? Are we allowing ourselves to be manipulated by the master of lies? Or are we standing on the ground of Jesus Christ, professing? who is King and Lord. See, even if we don't get completely who God is and what God is doing us, we have an opportunity to bear witness to Jesus Christ as King. Think about it. In a moment ago, we stood at the beginning of our service. We stood on the same ground as all who stand at the foot of the cross. We stood before our King of Kings confessing our sins. We confess that we have allowed the master of lies to manipulate us. We confess that he has tried to convince us of what truth is. And yet we confess that knowing that God invites us to his Son the one who is truth, who bears truth, who has the power to forgive us. Even more, it is an invitation into a life of truth in him. I've always been struck by this text, especially as we come to our creed of confession. Now, I know we don't recite the Apostles' Creed as often as we probably should in this congregation, but think about the words that you profess when you profess your faith in the Apostles' Creed. There are only two people that are mentioned in the Apostles' Creed besides that of God. Mary and Pontius Pilate. I've always wondered why we confess Pontius Pilate in our creed. Historically, it would have been more accurate to designate the time by citing Tiberius. When you read the Christmas story, you cite the time in which Jesus is born because of who was in reign, that of Tiberius, right? Tiberius is reigning. Caesar Augustus puts out the decree. And yet in our creed, we mention Pontius Pilate. In fact, this is what we say. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified and died. Could, we be, could it be that we designate Jesus' suffering in parallel with the one who is the first to bear witness? Is that why he makes it into our creed? 
because really he suffered under the temple authorities. He suffered at the hands of the people who would not open their eyes to how God was at work. Jesus suffered and died because of a world that had rejected him because he didn't fit into their desires of who Jesus should be. And yet we name Pontius Pilate the first one to name him as king. As we gather here today, maybe we are a bit more like Pilate than we might want to be. Maybe we are a bit more like Pilate than we want to be, and yet do we bear witness in the way that he bared witness? Do we name Christ as king even in our doubts and our wonder? Do we name Christ as king for all to see? Do we speak Christ in, as king in every language that we are given in our lives? Pilate made sure that all who were at the cross would be able to read the sign and know it to be true. We speak a lot of languages in our life as well. We speak a lot of languages in our work, in our social in the politics that we involve ourselves with, in our family life? Are we speaking Christ as king in each of those languages, the same as Pilate once stated for all to see? As we gather here today, we gather in the truth, a truth that cannot be broken in the brokenness of this world, a truth that brings light into darkness and grace and mercy to all who need it. As we gather, we gather in a truth that calls us to bear witness, not just in our own communities, but out into the world. A world that cannot keep us silent. Today we gather on this Christ the King Sunday. And for that we say, thanks be to God. Amen. Let us stand as we sing our hymn together, The Church is One Foundation. <clears throat> Tribulation and to 
let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, we stand before you having confessed our sins and ready to feast at the table you have prepared for all people. As we live forgiven and restored, make us ever eager to serve you as we follow your word. Let us not be silent in a word that needs your world that needs your truth proclaimed. And fill us with your Holy Spirit that we may witness to how you are at work in profound ways so that all might know you are King. Lord, in your mercy. God of grace and glory, you hear the prayers of all your people. We are grateful for how you amaze us in restoring health to those who have had surgery and are now recovering. We continue to pray for Nancy Arneson, Barb Sandberg, Marge Holly, for Kitty Walker, Mark Gehring, and Elisa Rogers. We celebrate that Ed Mersnick has returned home and is continuing to heal. And we trust in your care for all that we bring. And so we also name before you Nancy Hadley, Lori and Rod Andreas, Roger and Kate Magnuson, Richard Jensen, and Tom and Francis Oline's son-in-law, Rob, and for Bill Zerbies. Lord, we pray for Sophie. As she received a boost in her bone marrow transplant this week, we pray for the tiniest cells within her body. As you once formed us and breathed life into us, do this once again. Renew her today in every way. We continue to pray for her family, for Emily, Jeremy, Esme, Pastor Sue, and Jerry. And Lord, we pray for all who grieve, for the family and friends of John Ritter, for Pastor Tom as he mourns the loss of his friend Mike. We pray that they would know your comfort and a peace from you that passes all understanding. Lord, in your mercy. God of the world, we pray for all that is wrong in this world, for the injustice that has no limits. Release us of the hate and the judgment that too often affects, infects our communities. Make us one as we seek to live according to your command to go and make disciples. Lord, for this week, when we focus on our gratitude, make us ever thankful for all of the blessings you have given us. Protect our police, fire, and EMS. Empower our medical systems to provide comfort and care. Create supply chains for those who are hungry and in war-torn areas. And show forth your power in this world that we might be awakened by your spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We remember that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. And we join together in praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Please be seated.
Please stand. May this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. Let us join together in singing our closing hymn. Children of salvation, all who cling to Christ the Head, wake, oh wake, oh mighty nation, burst the foam of Zion's tear. Here is my heavenward depart, all the hosts of God most high. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord.